Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm joined again tonight by Peter Dickinson. He is with the uh, Atlantic Council editor, the Ukrainian uh, alert editor at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we've chatted with him about uh, Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine before, and I thought uh, it'd be good to check in with him because he's recently uh, done a series on uh, Kiev versus Kiev. Uh, Peter Dickinson, welcome to the show, sir. Hi, good to join you. Great to see you again. Uh, are you still in Kiev? Yes, yes. And how's life? Um, life in Kiev is is good. Uh, it's it's fairly fairly normal, like if I if I may say so. And uh, of course, there's a there's a sort of backdrop of of, of tension and trauma. Um, but life here is fairly fairly stable, fairly normal, uh, with its usual ups and downs. Um, we are anticipating a very difficult winter. Uh, there are expectations that we'll have a serious bombing campaign from Russia, as, as we had last year, uh, which will target the, the civilian infrastructure, so the energy the energy systems, and possibly also water, electricity, other power, other other core um, other core infrastructure. Uh, but uh, that that is part of you know that's part of the bigger war of course that's part of the you know the the, the reality that people here live with um so generally speaking kiev is, is is pretty pretty vibrant these days you um posted recently about uh about uh the challenges if russia ever won to to the world and democracy tell me about that yeah I mean, that's a key issue now um and of course we've had the we've had um uh, the last four months, really, of Ukraine's Ukraine's much uh, anticipated counteroffensive has really failed to produce the results that people were hoping for. Uh, they've not been able to replicate the very big success that Ukraine had in the second half of last year. Uh, and so, of course, some people now are, are starting to question: you know, where's this going? Can we, uh, you know, can we expect there to be any real progress? And, and, and is it? Is it now time to say, okay, let's uh, let's cut our losses, or let's let's reach a compromise, or let's accept that we can't have uh, you know the victory that the people were, were were previously hoping for? Uh, and it's a very and it's a very dangerous, um, a very a very slippery slope, you know, because uh, if we are to if we were to accept some form of compromise with the Russians and to that would mean essentially by almost any 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 format of compromise would be conceding land to Russia to give Russia land uh, you know, to allow Vladimir Putin's invasion uh, to succeed for it would vindicate him it would vindicate what he's done in Ukraine it would vindicate all of the um, you know, the, the, the the fundamental breaches of international law the the mass murders the 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 ethnic cleansing etc um, and that would have huge repercussions not just for Ukraine but for the international community wow. uh, of course Ukrainians would suffer. Sorry. Why do you think it's so so wider? And I, you know, lots of people have talked about it, but I want to hear your point of view. Why is this an issue for the Western world and for democracy? Well, I think first of all, it's uh, it, the immediate rea the immediate consequences would be uh, from Russia itself. Uh, so Russia, of course, would if Russia were able to gain uh, you know, con you know, confirm its grip over parts of Ukraine or even to take over the whole of Ukraine. Uh, there would be a, a major escalation in, in the war crimes we're already seeing here. So that would have a, a, a obvious, obvious dire consequences for the Ukrainian population. Um, and also that would lead to a massive wave of migrants, uh, refugees into the European Union, far larger than we saw in 2022, perhaps tens of millions of people. Uh, so that would have major consequences there in a practical sense for, for the European Union. Uh, Russia would also seek to go further. I think there's no real doubt that uh, if Putin were successful in Ukraine, he would then turn his attention to other countries of the former Soviet Union, first and foremost. So that would be, I think, realistically, Moldova would be the first uh, target. He would also look to the South Caucasus region, that's Armenia uh, and Georgia, primarily. Um, he would turn to Central Asia, Kazakhstan, and other countries in Central Asia would become immediately very, very, very much at risk. And then beyond that, if, if 
the fall of Ukraine would would very much decredit, uh, discredit uh, NATO as an organisation, uh, and Putin would look to push that further. He would look to attack further. He would look to test NATO, uh, probably in the Baltic states, in the Baltic regions, and then we would have a scenario, maybe in a year, maybe in two years, where people in America, people in Canada, in Britain, in France, are being asked, okay, are we going to go to war with Russia over? A border town in Estonia or Latvia? Are we going to risk World War Three over um, Narva, for example, a town in, in, in Estonia? Um, and if if they said no or hesitated or were demoralised by what had already happened in Ukraine, then NATO itself becomes questionable. It is inviolable. You know, the whole the, the whole basis of NATO is is Article Five. Is the idea that attack on one is an attack on all. It is a defensive alliance. Uh, it's it, it is attractive to its members because it offers guarantees of security. If you take that away, it, it's meaningless, really. It's not well, the, the whole purpose of the alliance fades. So um, we would be in a situation quite quickly, you know, within 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 a few years, I think, where the entire architecture of the of the the post Cold War era and perhaps even the post World War Two era. The security architecture, the international relations architecture of the world, would would be would collapse, and we'd find ourselves in a world where it was very much might is right, where it's dog eat dog, where powerful neighbours can openly bully their weaker their weaker neighbours, um, and the consequences would be desperate. We were talking about massive militarisation, um, closed borders, collapsing uh, global trade. You know, so the the economic costs would be would be huge. Uh, the opportunity costs on government spending in all Western countries would be huge because if you increase your military spending by however many percentage points, then of course you decrease other spending. Uh, and and if your if your trade balance, if your trade is going down, if your economy is suffering, then the pot gets smaller. So we'd be looking at a much poorer world, a much more um, detached world, a much less connected world, and a much more fearful world. And, and, and there would be wars going off quite regularly around the world. It would be it would be it would be a, a return to the sort of 18th century, perhaps early 19th century scenario, of course, but with modern weapons. Peter, I agree with you completely. But a lot of people don't. You've got, you know, huge parts of the Republican Party in the United States and lots of people elsewhere around the world that 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 don't think that we should continue funding Ukraine. That uh, that don't believe that uh, that you're right. That it's attack against freedom and democracy internationally. It's just a attack against Ukraine, and uh, they're willing to give up uh, portions of Ukraine, if not frankly all of Ukraine. How would you respond to them? Well, I mean, this argument about the, you know the, the costs of Ukraine, I think it's you know it's it's very cheap. This is this is the, this is perhaps the most frustrating aspect of this debate. Um, of course, people living in a peaceful environment are inclined to say, you know, I, 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 I am prepared to, to sacrifice you in order to maintain my peace. Unfortunately, that's that's human nature. And I think there's an element of that in all of us. I wouldn't want to be too judgmental of the people who make these arguments. Uh, I think many of them do it in good faith. Many of them do think it's not their problem uh, and they will have a rude awakening if this comes to pass. So if you don't like uh, the the costs of, of supporting Ukraine, then wait till you see the cost of of, of a Russian victory and then and containing Russia after it's victorious in Ukraine, the cost will be astronomical. But unfortunately, you know, all you can do is continue to explain this to them, to highlight what's going on. And I think issues like what we're seeing now with Hamas attacking Israel and uh, Russia quite openly siding with Hamas and Iran in that in that factor, we're seeing that. There are consequences for not dealing with this sort of authoritarian aggression. There are consequences. It enables, it emboldens these forces. And you see very clearly, I think I think if the West had responded forcefully to the invasion of Ukraine uh, 18 months ago, 20 months ago, uh, then you wouldn't have seen what we've recently seen in Israel, for example. Um, uh, and of course, there really, you China think that there's it. a connection between a less than uh, than stellar response to the Russian invasion has caused what a, a, an attitude that uh, that violence is okay it's caused a sense of impunity that you can try these things that the west is indecisive i think the west has clearly shown that it's not decisive over ukraine now again i don't want to be totally dismissive of 
what the West done, I think that would be, you know, absolutely incorrect. The West has done a lot. Uh, the, the aid that's been provided to Ukraine has been very important. It's allowed Ukraine to survive, first and foremost, uh, which is no, no small thing, of course. Uh, Russia holds 20% of Ukraine. If the West had not provided the aid they have, Russia would probably control 100% of Ukraine, and, and the, the death toll would be not in the hundreds of thousands, but would be in the, in the, in the millions. Uh, so it is a very significant uh, level of support the West has provided. But even so, we are seeing, and, and, and this will, you know, I'm sure everyone recognizes every time that we discuss weapons deliveries to Ukraine, there are delays, there are long debates, there, are, there is hesitation, there is, there is an excess of caution. Uh, every time that, the, that someone like Russia sees this, they're emboldened. They think, ah, the West is weak, we push further. This is why you see Russia engaging in, in nuclear blackmail, in, in threats, in, in, in um, intimidation tactics. They know that they can intimidate the West to step back and to be cautious, to be far more cautious than they should or could would necessarily be otherwise. And I think actors like Hamas certainly see that. Certainly the Iranians see that. And they will push further. Uh, they are the, These are regimes that are fundamentally uh, in opposition to the current world order. They don't think it's a just world order. They want to change that world order. They do not recognise... Um, the, the, the sort of Western imposed, as they see it, way of doing business internationally. And they wish to change that. Uh, and they will do anything to undermine it. You know, so you see these countries coming together now, coalescing. You, know, you see recently, just in Moscow, you see Hamas in Moscow being welcomed officially in the Kremlin, uh, together with Iran. Now, no country in the Western world would consider engaging directly with Hamas after what they did in Israel on, on October the 7th. And then, uh, that is clear that they were already, they were already a, a prior organisation, a prescribed organisation. But Russia openly welcomes them uh, because they see that there is a common ground there of an anti-Western coalition. Um, we shouldn't underestimate that. They have, they have different aims, of course. You know, they have different goals. Hamas is very clearly uh, intent on the destruction of Israel. Russia is very focused on the destruction of Ukraine. But fundamentally they are anti-western and when the west is weak they're emboldened that's that's inevitable two of the recent posts that uh, that you've uh, put are arming ukraine is cheap compared to the far higher price of a russian victory and uh, the enemies of democracy are testing us this is why war in ukraine was never just a war against ukraine however leaders of the western world just now starting to think about it might be too late Peter, it's great to chat with you. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes with Peter Dickinson of uh, the Atlantic Council uh, coming to us from Kiev, Ukraine uh, today. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest is uh, Peter Dickinson. He's uh, the uh, editor for the Atlantic Council in Ukraine. Um, he's coming to us uh, today from uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and uh, he's just uh, given us a, a review of why he thinks Ukraine is so critically important uh, to the West uh, as uh, as a bolster, as a as a as a as a wall uh, against uh, Soviet expansion, against Russian expansion, um, and uh, and why it's so important that uh, we are successful uh, in uh, Ukraine. Peter, let's uh, take a step back, if we could. Uh, and talk about what's happening on the ground. Uh, so, you know, please update us. Uh, you know, what's happening in the south of uh, Ukraine? Um, is this the chance of cutting off the land bridge to Crimea? Uh, you know, are these new munitions that are coming from uh, the United States, these cluster bombs, uh, uh, this artillery, you know, what what do you think? What do you hear? How do you, uh, how do you feel things are progressing? Well, the, 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 there's a lot of action around the front line in Ukraine. The front line is now approximately about six or 700 miles in length. So it's a very, very large uh, conflict zone. Uh, and there's a lot of different things taking place. Uh, but the line of contact itself is fairly static. Um, it's not a stalemate. It's wrong to talk about the war in terms of a stalemate. You know, there's a lot of dynamic movement going on, uh, and frankly, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of losses on both sides. Um, but the, the line itself is fairly static because it, it's a very defensive, uh, the, the, the situation, the circumstances of the war now favor largely the defenders. Um, Russia was able over the winter, last winter, so from, from November last year through to the spring of this year, 
Russia had a period of relative calm, which they to build a very sophisticated line of, of fortifications and entrenchments across southern Ukraine, eastern Ukraine as well, but mostly southern Ukraine, uh, to defend the, the so-called land bridge which links uh, Russia to Crimea. Uh, that has proven a very tough nut to crack. Uh, the Ukrainian forces have been fighting there with their own counter-offensive since June. So it's now, that, that's now it's in its... Uh, the fifth month now, and uh, they've made very little progress. There've been there's been some progress, uh, but it's been literally in, in in terms of a few miles here and there, some minor penetrations. There's been no breakthroughs, uh, and they have suffered significant losses. Uh, so they're simply they're simply struggling to get through these defences. We're talking about uh, very very well entrenched positions, which are uh, defended by wide minefields. So they're very difficult physically to get to. And then also Russia has air superiority, so that they're able to fire at Ukraine, attacking if Ukraine uses armor to assault. Um, and they have heavy artillery presence there. So it's proven almost impossible so far for Ukraine to break through on the south. Now in the east, we have Ukraine fighting on the offensive around the Bakhmut area, which was a big battle earlier this year, which Russia took that city. Now Ukraine is fighting back and, and, and threatening to encircle that city. And then further to the north again, you have Russia launching its own counteroffensive, and they're also making progress. They're looking to uh, encircle and take uh, the city of Avdivka, Avdivka uh, before the winter sets in. Again, they're making some progress, very heavy losses, but it's slow and it's small. We're talking about, you know, advances that are measured in meters rather than miles or, 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 or regions. So uh, it's a it's a very brutal at the moment offensive on both sides. Um, there's not a lot of progress. The, the parallels to World War One, I, I would say, are pretty obvious, uh, and pretty grim. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot happening away from the front lines. You've got, for example, I think the most important theatre is Crimea and the Black Sea. Uh, in recent months, Ukraine has launched a wide range of very uh, surgical strikes in Crimea, taking out the air defences, taking out key uh, port installations, and then finally hitting the Russian Black Sea fleet, which is based in Crimea, uh, in the port of Sevastopol. Uh, they destroyed a number of major ships and a submarine in Sevastopol which were in, in dock at the time um, with British supplied uh, Storm Shadow cruise missiles. Um, and they've also launched a number of uh, commando raids into Crimea, into the region. And um, this combined, this, this kind of Crimean offensive has succeeded in forcing the Russians to withdraw the vast majority of their warships, their fleet from Crimea to ports in Russia itself. And Russia is actually setting up uh, a new port for its Black Sea forces in the occupied parts of Georgia in the east of the Black Sea, so as far away from Ukraine as they could possibly get. So uh, this war began in Crimea in 2014, and the whole argument at the time was to protect the Black Sea fleet. Ukraine in recent months has essentially forced the fleet to retreat. They've pulled out to the east of Ukraine, to the east of the Black Sea, uh, and Ukraine has been able to. That that keeps Ukraine a little bit safer, not hugely, but a little bit safer. It also gives Ukraine more room to navigate the Black Sea for the Ukraine's um, merchant shipping and international merchant shipping to traverse the Black Sea and to come to Ukraine. And Ukraine has been able to uh, break the blockade of its ports. So there's movement going on around the, you know, around the wider war zone, uh, not only along the front lines, but the front lines itself are, are, are from a Ukrainian perspective, certainly offer a very um, sobering, I would say, uh, sobering uh, image. We've heard about uh, marine drones and attacks on this uh, big bridge that it was uh, was really critical to Putin's. Uh, Sort of ego. Tell us about uh, about those, if you could. Yeah, well, the Crimean Bridge uh, is a was a symbol of Russia's uh, is a symbol of Russia's uh, war against Ukraine. Uh, the The invasion of of Ukraine began in in spring two thousand fourteen with the seizure of Crimea, which was a a a, um, a brilliant operation, a lightning operation, which took the entire world by surprise. Uh, Russia. Brought, used the troops it already had in Crimea and brought in additional forces and seized the peninsula 
uh, with very little opposition within the space of, of, of a couple of days. Uh, they then held a, a fig leaf uh, referendum to, to cry and uh, add some legitimacy to this the occupation um, and have occupied Crimea ever since. So that's almost almost 10 years. That will be 10 years next February. Uh, so within within a few months. Um, and that is that was that the success of Crimea is the basis for the whole uh, war that we've seen since. Again, the, uh, the issue I was raising earlier, the international community did not respond forcefully to the seizure of Crimea in 2014. Therefore, Putin made the, draw the obvious conclusion, well, I'm going to go further. And he did go further. He went into mainland Ukraine. Um, so the bridge that was built from Russia to Crimea was very much a symbol of the permanency of Russia's occupation. It was Russia saying to the, to, to, to the, to the Russian public, to Ukraine and to the world, we are here forever. This is now part of Russia. And the bridge was kind of a link, a chain saying, this is our territory. We're taking this territory for long term. Uh, so, of course, it's been a target for Ukraine now. Uh, Ukraine hit the bridge the first time last October and disabled it partially. Uh, they've hit it again since then and again caused some partial uh, disruption. Uh, but the expectation is now that Ukraine, it, it's thought that Ukraine probably now has the potential to fully um, destroy the bridge or certainly break break the communications on the bridge but they are now waiting uh for the opportune moment ukraine has recently received new missiles from the from the west from america the uh the so-called atacums the atacms uh longer range missiles so um the expectation is that if we're not sure exactly if they have them yet or not but they've already received some and they've used them very effectively the expectation is that they will take the bridge down uh, at the opportune moment as the attack on Crimea escalates. Um, the, the, the marine drones that you mentioned are, are a separate issue, really. Uh, they have been a very effective tool in the attack on, on the attacks on Russian shipping. Uh, Ukraine has a very, very uh, dynamic uh, military defence tech sector. Uh, a lot of Ukraine's... Uh, for many years, Ukraine's had a very, very... Uh, vibrant IT industry, a tech industry. And they, you, you know, a lot of the people from that sector have sort of come across to the military side since the full-scale invasion began in 2022. Uh, you know, and, and they are producing some very interesting uh, kits of very, very, very clever tools. One of them that they've developed is these marine marine, uh, marine drones, that, which they, 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 they've christened them the sea babies. Uh, and they have proven a very effective tool against Russian shipping. They've managed to hit a number of warships uh, and other Russian shipping and, for, again, force Russia to move away from Ukraine and the Black Sea to ease the blockade. Because Russia was blockading Russia, Ukraine's ports since the, the weeks before the war began, before the full-scale invasion, so from January 2022. Uh, they've now managed to push them back because it's too dangerous for these Russian ships to to act in the Black Sea. I think I think what we're seeing with the drones is is the future of warfare. Um, we're seeing drones on land in Ukraine, of course, itself, all along the battlefront uh, in Russia as well. Uh, but the Black Sea, I think, is where they've been most effective. Let's uh, change to the business environment. You posted that something like eighty four percent of uh, businesses are back operational as part of uh, the Ukraine American Ukraine uh, Chamber of Commerce. Tell me what's happening. From a business standpoint, yeah, the business community. I mean, that's of course operational where possible in terms of you know where it's physically where they're physically able to be. Of course, country businesses in the occupied parts of Ukraine are not operational. Uh, businesses along the front lines are not operational. So there's a lot that aren't. But those that are not physically uh, prevented from operating by the you know the immediate presence of the war are largely operational. Um, I, I run a business magazine in in, in Ukraine and, uh, and and have done for many years, and we've we've had a we've had a you know we're, we're preparing an issue now. We've just published a, a month ago our first issue of the wartime period, and, and frankly, it was very successful. There was a lot of there was a lot of uh, a lot of engagement from the community, the business community. People were very eager to to engage, and that is a always a very strong sign because um, when the crisis when crises hit. The first thing people cut is their marketing budget, is their is their communications budgets. Um, so that was a very encouraging indication for for for, for from a, you know from me as a publisher, of course, but from a broader perspective in terms of where the economy is now, where where Ukraine is going. Um, 
I mean, I wouldn't want to overstate it. Of course, the economy has been absolutely hammered by this war uh, and the situation is not good by any stretch of the imagination. But the the creativity, the resilience, the adaptability that Ukrainians, Ukrainian businesses have shown uh, has been remarkable. Uh, and, and they've managed to adapt and, and uh rework their business models to get around many of the, the the logistical problems the supply problems the the market loss the loss of market access uh, and, the, and the physical problems of exporting you know with the black sea ports under under blockade that was a huge issue for ukraine uh they've had to resort to they've had to switch around to land using the eu borders by land trucking using trains um it's been really remarkable to see how they've been able to do that um, in ways that have, you know, kept the economy ticking over. The, the Ukrainian economy is expected to grow this year. Now, it's growing from a very low base, of course, because it fell heavily last year, of course. But nevertheless, it is growing. And it's expected to grow this year and it's expected to grow further next year. Um, and the, you know, so that, that speaks for itself, I think. Peter, a lot of people can't imagine, you know, you sitting in uh, your your uh, office and, and working in the middle of a, in the middle of a war zone. Um, tell me what life is like for you. Yeah, I mean, there, there is there is an element of, there is a surreal element to, to it sometimes. You do find, I do find that sometimes for myself, I even have to pinch myself sometimes and think. Um, I mean, I, I think like, you know, it, 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 is a, it is a reminder, this the experience of the past 20 months here in Ukraine uh, is a reminder that, you know, life goes on, that people uh, people will find a way they will find the way of, of making things work um i mean my day-to-day -day life is not really that different to to, to the, the you know the pre-war period um i think part partly because i live outside of the city i have my own uh, you know we have our own power source here and our own water source supplies at home uh if there are power cuts which which are which we had a lot last winter they, we haven't had many of them actually in, the, in, in recent months but that was certainly a factor last winter we expect that to be a factor again this winter uh, again because we expect russia to to resume its, its large-scale bombing of the country's infrastructure um but beyond that uh, the only major real differences to day-to-day -to -day life would be, yeah, you have air raids. So if you're in the city, you may have an air raid. You may have to abandon an, an event you're attending, for example, or you may have to leave a shop you're in. Um, we have uh, curfews. So late at night, if you're out in the city in the evening, say, at a business event or meeting friends or attending some sort of an event, you have to factor in you need to get home before the curfew finishes. Uh, again, as I live outside Kiev, I have to leave early because I have to get out. And the, I know the taxi driver has to get back um, before the curfew is imposed. Uh, but even that is not a it's not a major issue. I mean, of course, it means you can't stay out all night, but um, uh, that that's not a huge huge issue for me personally. Um, the curfew when in the in the early months of the war was 10 p.m. So that was quite a, a restriction. It meant that by 8 p.m., for example, you had to start thinking about how to get home. Now the curfew has been extended to midnight, so you can be out. I mean, I can be out in Kiev till 10, 10.30 at night um, uh, uh, before I start making my way home, which is which is not a major, a major you know, imposition on on me personally. So uh, these are these these are the realities of day to day life for me. But of course, for many millions of people in Ukraine, day to day life is is is, is you know, unrecognizably uh, more difficult. You know, those living near the front lines who are bombed on a daily basis, those who have uh, had to flee their homes, those who are living under occupation, first and foremost. Millions of Ukrainians are currently, as we speak, living under Russian occupation. Uh, and the horrors that they are experiencing are um, you know, beyond, beyond comprehension, frankly. I mean, it's, it's absolutely uh, chilling when you read... Uh, accounts or meet people who've come from those regions, which you, I often do in Kiev, uh, and and learn about how the you know what is going on there and what they are being exposed to. Uh, so you know it's a, it's a mixed it's a mixed it's a very mixed experience. Uh, what is going on here? My life here in Kiev is not necessarily representative of what's going on in Ukraine in general. Ukraine's a very large country. I mean, I I think that's important to stress every time I'm engaging with the international media because it's not necessarily appreciated it's the biggest country in europe there's a lot of different 
realities in today's Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's a large country with a large population. And so it's, it's, it varies very much where you are, where, you know, it depends where you are. Peter, really appreciate you joining us and updating us what's going on. Uh, as a final word, what, what would you like to say to the people of uh, Toronto, the people of Canada? Uh, first of all, I would I would extend the, my thanks, personal thanks, and I, I, and I believe the thanks of, of Ukrainians for the support that Canada has offered and continue, continues to offer to Ukraine. I think it's you know, it's recognised and it's welcomed and it's very much appreciated. Uh, but the, the main message is, you know, don't let this this become normalised. Don't let what's happening in Ukraine today become. Uh, a normalized process that's kind of accepted and and, 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 and uh, allowed to continue. It is not normal, and it's a very, very big threat to the way that everybody, certainly in the Western world, lives today. Um, if it is allowed to continue, if Russia is allowed to succeed, even partially, the ramifications for everybody in the Western world will be will be will be profound, and you will not like them. Uh, so don't let it get any worse than it already is. Uh, the good news is that Ukrainians are ready to fight this thing, and they will fight, and they are fighting, and they will fight. All they need is the support of the West, in my opinion, and they will, will win. It's not going to be soon. It might not be in, 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 it won't be this year. We hope it's next year. Uh, but I see no, no real weakening in Ukraine's resolve to win, to defend themselves. All they need is support. So my main message would be, please keep that support up. Please do so for for Ukrainians, but do it for yourselves as well, because ultimately uh, you will pay a price if if Ukraine falls. Peter Dickinson, uh, Ukraine editor for the Atlantic Council. Thanks so much for joining us and updating on, and updating us on what's going on in Ukraine. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We're going to take a break and be back in two minutes with my own views on this issue. Stay with us, everybody.